that cause these kind of stones. Um, so what is a kidney stone? Well, they're really deposits of hard minerals. Um, there's, we'll see in the next slide, it talks about the different types of stones there are. Um, some of the names that we use, renal calculi is one. Lithiasis means stone or a stone in the kidney. Nephrolithiasis means kidney stone disease. And we usually classify them based on what they're composed of and where they're located in the urinary tract. So this is based on the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive Kidney Disease. And um, kidney stones are fairly common, especially in what we call the Stone Belt, which is the southern United States. And that has to do with the warm temperature and the dehydration, like I was talking about. Uh, more than one, one million cases are, are reported annually. Um, the incidence is one in 272 people. Most stones are fairly small. A lot of kidney stones are diagnosed when you go to the ER and you have an x-ray for some other problem. Let's say it's your gallbladder or it's uh, diverticulitis. And oh, by the way, you've got a couple of small stones in your kidneys. A lot of people walk around with stones and they do every day and they have no idea they have kidney stones. Um, it's only when they start to pass that they become symptomatic that you start to notice them. A majority of stones will pass on their own. Um, depending on who you talk to and what you read, the size, this says six millimeters, is usually six millimeters or less are usually passable. And I think that's a fair, a fair statement. Um, you know, there's been some data that says that stones that are five millimeters or greater have less than a 50% chance of passing on their own. Um, so, you know, if you end up in the ER and you have a kidney stone and you're having pain and the ER doctor says, well, it's only two or three millimeters, you'll probably be able to pass it. Well, they're, they're telling you the truth. You probably should be able to pass a stone that size. But when they get into that range that they're over six millimeters, the chances of you passing that on your own are fairly small. Um, and that's when you usually end up getting um, referred over to see myself or Dr. Mobley and we can talk about the options. So what causes stones? Um, probably the, the most important thing is, is the concentration of the urine. And that's where when you ever see your doctor and they tell you how do you prevent stones, and we usually recommend water is the most important thing. And that's because if the, you have enough water in your urine, those little crystals are harder for them to find each other and start to form a stone. And so um, the most important thing you can do is drink water. Um, so concentrated urine, if the urine doesn't move freely, it can cause stones. Um, we sometimes see that men who have problems yeah. emptying their bladder will start to form bladder stones because the urine sits around for a long period of time and that's when stones start to form. Uh, the pH of your urine has a lot to do with stone formation. So neutral pH is 7. Anything below that is considered acidic and everything above that is considered alkaline. And certain stones we know form in acidic urines and we know that certain stones form in alkaline urines. Typically we try to alkalize urine because a majority of stones will form in acidic urines. So a lot of uh, medication we often prescribe, its whole purpose is to increase the pH of your urine. Uh, gout, if anybody's ever had gout before, you know that has to do with uric acid. Uric acid, if there's a lot of it in your urine, can start to form kidney stones. So people with gout have usually a higher incidence of uric acid stones. Um, this next problem called hyperparathyroidism is basically we all have these glands called parathyroid glands and they regulate the calcium in our body and if they are overactive you start to basically get more calcium in your blood and then your kidneys filter that increased calcium and then you start forming stones so we will often you know if you form a a number of stones or you're what I would call a repeat offender and you've had multiple stones, we will evaluate you to make sure that you don't have this problem. Uh, people who have bowel disease can have increased stones. 
uh, urinary tract infections can increase your risk of stones. And some medications, and under there I put Topamax because Topamax is often prescribed for uh, migraines and seizure disorder, and it is a known increased risk for stones when you're on that medication. So people would never so types of stones. The most common stone out there is calcium oxalate. Eighty percent of all stones in the United States are calcium-based stones. So if you just have a stone statistically you more than likely have a calcium stone. Most stones are not just one type of substance. They can be mixed. They can have calcium oxalate, they can have uric acid, um, and you know when we send off the stones, when we remove them during surgery, they will give us the composition and the percentages of what is in your stone. Um, calcium phosphate stones, Struvite stones are fairly uncommon. Um, you see those mainly in people with urinary tract infections. Um, and they won't usually clear themselves. You gotta, you know, or you won't clear the infection until you get rid of the struvite stones. Uric acid stones, like we just talked about, are usually secondary to the increased uric acid, and you get that from either being on one of those high protein diets, which is the, all the fad now. So there's people who've never had a kidney stone in their entire life and they go on these Atkins diets where they eat nothing but meat and fat. And, and that diet increases the load of uric acid or acid to your kidneys and that increases your risk of stone formation. So, and so people often have pain that starts in this area and as the stone starts to move down the tube, the pain can actually start to move towards the the front of your abdomen and around the side. So it'll start here and then it moves down into this region. And that's as the stone moves down. And so that's probably the most common thing and it's pretty noticeable. If you've never had a kidney stone before or if you know anybody who's had one, they'll tell you it, it's very severe pain. It's, you know, um, some women would say it's worse than childbirth. And so it's, it's, it's fairly intense. Some common things that are associated with it, you can have nausea and vomiting if the pain is severe enough, uh, not feeling well. If you have other problems, let's say an infection at the time of stone, you can really become sick pretty quick. Um, you can have a high temperature. Uh, when we check your blood count, we can see that your white blood cells are, are elevated. Um, when we check your urine, we can see white blood cells in your urine. We can sometimes see red blood cells in your urine. Occasionally, you would actually be able to see the crystals of the stone in your urine. Um, when you're having an acute episode, you want, you know, the most important thing is you want to get your pain under control. So that's what we're going to be talking about, is how can we get you comfortable and what do we need to do about your stone. But when you come back in, that's when we're going to talk about, all right, why are you forming these stones? What's your diet like? What do you, um, you know, your daily activities? How much water do you drink? You know, those are questions that we will typically ask you. And then if you have a history of stones and you're able to pass them easily, well, history usually repeats itself. You will probably pass a stone again. If you have a history of never passing a stone and you got a small stone, that will sometimes dictate, well, maybe we should go ahead and get you scheduled for surgery because you're not going to pass it. You've got history that shows you don't pass stones, so we just need to get you scheduled for surgery. So this slide, basically, you can see this is what a picture on a CT scan looks like. And on the right side of the screen, you can see that bright white substance, and that's all stone. That's a very large stone in this individual. Uh, CT scans are predominantly the, the test of choice because they are so accurate. They will only miss a stone by 2% of the time. When you do x-rays, which is called an abdominal x-ray, or when you do ultrasounds, their detection rate is much lower, but they're, they don't have the radiation that you get with, with CT scans. So, you know, we sometimes do ultrasounds and x-rays uh, to limit X uh, radiation exposure and, and to follow up whether or not you've passed a stone. Um, some of these other things on here talking about cystoscopy, well, that's usually, uh, you know, when we think we, we're going to have to take your stone out when we schedule that. So treatments in the very beginning when you're there and you have the pain, you want the pain control and that's what the initial treatment is. 
if you can't get your pain controlled on medications, that's sometimes when they call us in the middle of the night and say, hey, what do you want us to do? And that's when we admit you to the hospital and get you scheduled for surgery. You know, if we can get your pain under control and you can take medications and your stone is small enough, then it's reasonable to send you home from the ER and you try to pass the stone. Um, we will eventually try to figure out why you're forming stones and how we can prevent those stones. Um, we usually give you strainers to strain your urine because we don't know you pass the stone unless you tell me you pass the stone. And so the strainer is just like a strainer you use for food. You, you urinate through it and it catches the stone if it comes out. As you can so some of the surgical procedures that we do, uh, probably the most common thing is lithotripsy. And you hear a lot of people talk about shock waves. And so shock waves is this word right here, extracorporeal shock wave or ESWL. And the way it works is that we use sound waves that we send through the body that are targeted at the stone that break up the stone. So there's no going in through the urethra, there's no incisions, it's all sound waves from the outside. When this technology first came along, you probably heard of people who used to sit in horse troughs or tubs of water and have it, and that's how it used to be administered. And today it's much different. We have uh, newer uh, machines that have the fluid contained, you just lay on a typical surgical table um, and then we target the stone with x-rays and we break up the stone. Um, and so that's what shockwave is. Uh, the other most commonly per performed uh, treatment for stones is this word called laser or basket extraction. And that's where we go in through the urethra with a telescope or a metal rod or however you want to refer it. And we look with a, with a camera and see the stone with our own eyes. And we use either a basket to grab the stone or we use a laser to break up the stone into smaller pieces. It says that one of the best innovations in urology over the last two decades is the development of these instruments, this ureteroscope, these little tiny tubes that we're able to look into where the stone is and get to it without any real trauma to your urinary system. That's why you typically can recover from a kidney stone in about a week to two weeks. And then you're compared to having a major open surgery for a stone that would take you sometimes up to six weeks to get over. And so, so I think the main thing that anybody that has stones wants to know is how can I prevent stones? And, and, and again, I think the reason why it's number one on this list here is hydration because it is the most important thing you can do to prevent kidney stones. Um, you know, this says drink three liters a day of fluid and that's usually what is recommended. Three liters is quite a bit of water. If you have a lifestyle where you're inside and you're not sweating much and um, you know, you don't have a lot of, of loss of water through whatever means during the day, three liters may be excessive for you. If you are, you know, like I said, working construction or landscape and you're outside and it's 100 degrees and you're sweating all day long, three liters may not be enough for you. And so what I usually tell my patients is, is that look at your urine. If your urine looks like tap water, you're hydrated. If your urine looks like it's amber or light orange or anything darker than a light yellow, that means your body is trying to conserve as much water as it possibly can and that you're dehydrated and that you need to drink more water. So an easier thing to judge whether or not you're hydrated is what your urine looks like. Um, lemonade is a, or lemon juice, lemon concentrate, anything you want to add to your water that has lemon in it is going to decrease your stone risk because it has citrate. Citrate is a known inhibitor of stones. Our bodies have natural citrate in them. The low so, sodium diet is another thing that I commonly recommend and is commonly recommended by urology because of the way that your kidneys work. And so um, if whenever I do these evaluations for people who have multiple stones, we'll usually collect your urine for 24 hours. 
and that tells me exactly how much sodium is in your urine, how much citrate is in your urine. There's a number of things that we look at. And often the sodium is, is sky high, twice, twice the normal value that it should be. And so, you know, I think that's a factor of we put too much salt on our food and a lot of the foods that we buy already have a lot of sodium incorporated in them. If you like canned soups, they have a ton of sodium in them. You should look sometime, you know, probably 50% of your daily value in one can of soup. So it's something to look at and make sure that you're not just, if you say, well, I don't salt my food. Well, maybe you're just getting all your salt from the, it's already incorporated in there. You don't even know it. And then sometimes there are people who, no matter what you do, you have what we call a metabolic disorder that causes you to form stones. And when you have a metabolic disorder, no matter what you do, diet-wise, drinking water, activity, you're always going to form kidney stones. And that's when we prescribe you medications that help hopefully decrease that stone formation. There are some, people, some urologists out there that would tell you that all kidney stones are preventable. Um, I don't know if I agree with that because I've known some people who are very um, diligent about trying to prevent stones. They take their medication, they continue to form stones, and uh, you know, no matter what they do. So I think some people will always have this problem. But I think a majority of kidney stones are preventable with diet and, and really just hydration.